Hi folks, this is Glenn Maurer and today uh, we're going to do a show on the Next Step TV Santa Barbara uh, addressing a chronic and seemingly ancient almost and, and intractable problem, who gets to live in Santa Barbara. Um, limits on space, water, infrastructure, zoning and planning rules, uh, the com presence of millions of people nearby who would like to live here, um, and then recently aggravated by the growth of local colleges and out of area students and all the pressures that that have come to bear on uh, as I say almost ancient question of who gets to live in Santa Barbara. Uh, try, I'm going to try to talk about some of these and we have a wonderful guest to address that. Um, Rob uh, with the Santa Barbara Housing Authority. Uh, Rob Pearson, <laughs> I should say, I, I, since I've known Rob for so long I forget that he has a last name. Rob Pearson, Santa Barbara Housing Authority. Um, is uh, with us and all of these things that I've mentioned and other things that he knows about are part of this problem. Rob, uh, thank you for coming on board. Thank you for asking me. Uh, you've been with the Santa Barbara Housing Authority forever. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, 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 I say that only because I cannot remember a time when you weren't in charge of the Santa Barbara Housing Authority. Well, it's not because I can't find a job anywhere else. It's just been a labor of love. Um, I've been there now 35 years, starting in uh, 1981 as the deputy director. And prior to that, uh, I was the redevelopment manager for the city of Santa Barbara. Uh, the Housing Authority is a separate agency, but they were looking for a new director at, back in the early 80s. And uh, I had some concerns about redevelopment and where we were headed with downtown redevelopment. I've been kind of reflecting on that and a, a comment that I want to make about that. And, uh, unintended consequences sometimes right. of some of the things we do. So uh, it's been a labor of love. I, I saw redevelopment as kind of having a negative impact on affordable housing right. and wanted to make sure that as we went through redevelopment, much like we go through some things today regarding the college impact. Well, so let's make, let, me, let me get a little foundational okay. background here. The city of Santa Barbara, th this agency, the Santa Barbara Housing Authority that you run, is for the city of Santa Barbara. Right. Not the county? No. But, but there are do, other agencies? We, yeah, there is a county housing authority, and we work closely with them. Uh, they have a bigger presence in North County. We tend to serve throughout the South County, but we are, as a jurisdictional agency, uh, confined to building new units in the city of Santa Barbara. We do assist people through our Section 8 voucher program throughout the South okay. Coast. I'm just trying to get the, the, the parameters. <sighs> How did the city, how did the housing authority get started okay. in Santa Barbara? What is its authority? Is it part, is it just another city agency? Is it part of the, what the city council, okay. uh, are you under the city council well, or what? Tell me, me about that. Let me that. explain that. Uh, prior to our agency being created, there was a county housing authority and still is that operated throughout the county. But what I heard is in the late 60s, as prior to my arrival in 81, they wanted to have their own housing authority or at least three city residents on the county housing authority. And the county housing authority board members is a board of five appointed by the board of supervisors. And the county said no to the city's request to put three city residents on that. So the city decided to form its own under state law. Uh, any jurisdiction can form its own housing authority, be they a city or county, and they formed us in 1969. We got going in, six, in the early 70s uh, for the primary purpose of providing public housing, low rent public housing, in Santa Barbara City. So that was our charter there in the early 70s when we got formed. It was actually voted on by the, by the public to create. Is right. It? Uh, there is a thing in the California Constitution called Article 34, and it was put there in the 50s because some communities uh, that had heard about public housing, particularly on the East Coast, were concerned about what negative influences it might have. So in our California Constitution, before you build public housing, you need a vote of the people uh, in order to build those units. And in Santa Barbara, we've been to the voters three times, and we have kind of a ongoing provision that adds a number of units that we can build per year that the voters voted on. Okay. And so that, and that's at, through the Santa Barbara Housing Authority, and that agency is, how is it related to the, the mayor and the city council and the city manager? Okay, well, I'm not a city employee. The board of commissioners that oversees the housing authority is appointed by the city council. They appoint the seven-member board. 
We have five at-large positions and two tenant commissioners. They have to be participants in our program, and that's under state law. The California Health and Safety Code says uh, is the law that governs how housing authorities are formed and how they operate. So we are a separate agency from the city, but the board is appointed by the city council, uh, much like the redevelopment agency when it existed. Uh, the, the, how, the city council could vote to be the board of commissioners if they wanted to, but they've always had a separate board appointed. So there's some political pressure. There's some political pressure, and that's what created us, that there was a need for affordable housing in Santa Barbara, so the city council saw fit back in 1969 to create it. But it's also somewhat independent. It's somewhat independent, but if the council didn't like what we were doing, they could vote on any Tuesday to disband the current board and... Believe you me, I know that. <laughs> um, so, your primary purpose from our uh, uh, creation the reason is for affordable housing right for low low income low primary. income housing and they sometimes do that by creating actual uh, housing tracks or what apartment mm -hmm. complexes they in the old days they'd call them the projects the but projects uh, everything that we've built in Santa Barbara because when we were formed this city was pretty well built out so we have done more what we call scattered site public housing which I think is better for the community and the residents it is. because it disperses the population and I'm proud about saying that I think m all of our public housing looks better than most of the private sector apartments because we, we are very proud about it, we keep it up, we build to high standards uh, so that the neighborhoods aren't impacted and that the tenants respect the product that they're living in. I think that's important. Um, so, but you also provide housing in other fashions. You, yes. Section 8 you mentioned. Uh, yeah. Briefly, what is Section 8? Well, back in the 70s, uh, and this was uh, under the Reagan administration, um, they wanted to disperse uh, low-income families that were receiving federal housing assistance. And uh, it was to utilize the private sector housing that's out there. So they created the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program which basically we contract with the federal government, HUD, and we have a contract right now with them, and it's grown over the years as we've applied for additional vouchers. Uh, we have approximately 2,400 vouchers that we can give to low-income households. And that voucher, with that voucher, the low-income family goes out and looks in the private sector to rent an apartment, and they pay 30% of their income to the landlord, and we pay the balance using the voucher to the landlord on the first of every month, the difference between 30% of the household's income and what is the fair market rent, uh, according to HUD. Mm -hmm. HUD always lags. They, uh, they don't want to increase the cost of the program, so they don't always keep pace with our market. And We've seen dramatic increases in rents this last year particularly, and I've just, I think, won a battle with HUD to get our fair market rents increased to a more market level. Uh, uh, traditionally, there's been hundreds, if not thousands, of people on the Section 8 waiting list. Oh yes, we have pro we closed the waiting list approximately two years ago because we have about 6,000 households on that wait list, and we predominantly these days serve seniors and disabled. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of low-income families uh, already moved with their feet to other jurisdictions right. because they can't wait, but the seniors and disabled household tends to evolve as people retire and try to live on Social Security, so they come to our door for that voucher because Social Security doesn't so what, meet the rent. What percentage of the housing that you might provide uh, would Section 8 okay. uh, equal? We, we have about 3,600 units of assistance in, in broad terms. 2,400 of those are Section 8, so the other 1,200 are hard units that we've built, own, and operate through a variety. It's no longer just the HUD public housing program as a funding source. Uh, the government's created the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a whole <laughs> show in itself to explain how the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program operates. But it's basically, uh, it's one where the federal government allows us to compete for tax credits. When we get those tax credits, uh, we bring in an investor, and for every dollar of tax credit I get, give them, they give me a dollar to build the building. Well, that, you're right. That's all that we need to know. Uh, but, the, but the point I'm trying to get to is in terms of physical housing uh, facilities that exist. We, we have uh, about, about 1,200 about, units uh, scattered over the units that are physical that you've built. Yes, that are housing throughout the city. Built. And you have about how many vouchers? 2,400. So... And I know, is there any other source of housing that you can assist people in finding? 
Um, because we are created under state law, we are. Some people think that we're a, an extension of HUD. HUD has just been a primary funding source, but as a creature of state law, that health and safety code uh, section uh, under which we operate sets forth our powers, and we can do a lot more than just low income, provided we don't compete with the private sector as a general rule of law. Government agencies generally try right. to stand down from that in, in America. What uh, so? In Santa Barbara, um, there, we, we, we've, we've, I alluded to it in the beginning, and you alluded to it when we were talking about before, that we became sort of one of these barbell cities. Yeah, barbell uh, city is uh, the term. Uh, tell us what the idea being populations on each end of the economic uh, spectrum. Uh, a colleague of mine was explaining, we were talking about San Francisco's woes and uh, in terms of being able to house its middle class. And I, I think throughout our country in desirable places, particularly on both coasts of the U.S., um, you're seeing uh, in the Internet, people are able to kind of live almost anywhere and, and work remotely. Um, people that have money want to live in the cool places, Santa Barbara being one of them. Um, you're seeing the, with housing prices rising, we're losing our middle class. Uh, I saw an article just today about Palo Alto and the city council voting to create housing to serve households <coughs> between $150,000 a year and $250,000 a year because they can't afford to own a home in Palo Alto. And that's the middle class in Palo Alto? That's the middle class in Palo Alto. Uh, their median income is quite a bit higher than ours. Santa Barbara's is $75,400 for a family of four. So even our median income is uh, quite a ways away from being able to afford to buy a home. And the, you mentioned the, re the redevelopment agency that existed in Santa Barbara, and, that, and, and one of the things the redevelopment agency did, to my chagrin, was take a lot of the old SRO housing, the single resident occupant housing, which was being occupied by people with social security checks and other low income right. people, move them out. They would maybe qualify for Section 8 vouchers if they could find a person that would let rent to them. Right. Uh, but otherwise, that, that, prop, that, that housing was lost. Has anything been put in its place? Well, the, you know, the creation of our redevelopment agency and housing authority kind of happened at the same time, mm -hmm. and I think the city fathers were being wise that they knew that there would be displacement. I don't think our country and our urban planners, of which I'm an urban planner by education, really quite saw the impact that redevelopment would cause. Um, the goal was to preserve our sales tax base and make sure we kept retail in downtown Santa Barbara. I held that job <laughs> up in a, from like 78 to 81 and I knew the impacts would be rather severe because we had a lot of those SRO hotels downtown and once the redevelopment process takes place and property rights are pretty much a private market function, those owners that own those hotels when they saw better shops around them would think about do I want to stay in this business? Yeah. Uh, the Virginia Hotel is a classic example. It was one of the worst hotels in downtown Santa Barbara, but it provided housing for the very poor and the destitute. Now it's a Holiday Inn Express. So my question is, though, are any of those, does a housing authority have the ability or own or is contemplating owning equivalent type of housing to replace that housing that was lost? We, a decade back. We have now, we are now playing catch up. I think a lot of communities are because that housing that you described, the SRO Hotel, used to house people or today are homeless. And, yes. and because we as communities didn't get on the bandwagon to build that kind of housing, a lot of the housing authority's early product was large family units, three, four, and five bedroom units, wow. because that was what the federal money was doing at the time. It said, we want you to build large family units mm -hmm. because we want to take care of family poverty. The need for taking care of homeless or people that used to live in the SRO hotel is, was kind of avoided for many years, and now we're catching up with that. So. Again. Yes, we built some units. We, okay. built, we have built El Carrillo, which is 61 units for formerly homeless. We've built Artisan Court, where we have a 20% of those units designed for uh, the home, formerly homeless and Bradley Studios. We're also doing a better job of making sure the homeless get an application into us for those other units that we operate, including Section 8. Okay, so the other problem then is the is, uh, supply. Not, not that if you can't own it all, if you can't yeah. build enough to, to find space enough and places, uh, 
the, the drivers against, uh, I'm sorry, the consumers of housing in Santa Barbara are, are expanding all the time. Um, Airbnb type of stuff. Uh, how, how, how is it, what was the impact of this? Well, it's been an interesting thing is that while the Housing Authority is really a production arm for the city, you know, we don't delve into policy. We did last year when we all of a sudden realized we had 1,400 units on Airbnb and VRBO that used to be long-term rental, rentals. And we've, if we, the Housing Authority builds 50 units a year, that's a good year. Uh, and if we lose 1,400 out the back door, what are we doing? So I think my board and others are looking at some of the policy implications of, in my mind, kind of income inequality run amok, uh, the sharing economy, and what are the impacts on our housing market? Yes, uh, I mean, it's 1,400, you said. Yes, and then we have to talk about student housing. Well, I was just going to get to that next, because uh, we have an increased uh, uh, desire by, on some, well, City College being uh, the most blatant example, in my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, to try to create City College into something other than a community college. So, I mean, my, my position is known on this for yes. years. Um, now we're talking about private dormitories and other, uh, and, and converting uh, housing into department. student housing to attract even more students to the area not from this area, but to the area from outside. What impact well, would that have? Well, with my conversations with City College so far is, I, I understand they have a provision in the law that they have to take anybody in California to our community college, uh, but they don't have to be recruiting out of state and out of country. That's and we've sure. got 6% uh, foreign students now at City College. and. Apparently, it creates a great experience for all the students by mixing, and I, and I don't have a problem with it. But nobody has ever asked, how are we going to house them? And they do need a roof over their heads, so they have taken up a lot of housing. We have four foreign language schools teaching foreigners English, uh, high school students, basically, mm -hmm. about 700 each. And nobody asked them, where are you going to house the students? So they are taking up bed space and apartments that used to go to the workforce. I used to, uh, well, I'll just give you the neighborhood in which I live. Uh, as I walk my dog in the morning, uh, a little bit, you know, pretty good little walk, but it's the same route. We've been taking the same route now for 10 years. There's now at least six or seven uh, of these suburban uh, middle class housing that are converted to student housing. There's right. three and four students, Westmont, City College, uh, some nursing, uh, nurses, I think. Uh, but there's a good many of these houses which would have been occupied by families or renters are now congested. You know, it's very profitable for the, oh. for the owner of that property. What's, what's happened, uh, and I've talked to some of these students as I walked one neighborhood looking for Airbnb rentals, um, the, the owner is furnishing them in, in a studio, putting two beds per studio unit, three beds in the one bedrooms, and four bedrooms, if not five, uh, four, four beds, if not five beds in the two bedrooms, and they're getting $900 a bed. And if you do the math on that, there's no way that a family that is middle class can compete with those kinds of rents. No. And the landlord is within his rights to do what of he's course. doing, but it loses housing supply. Well, it creates a zoning impact also. I mean, separate from your, it's not your your <laughs> mission in life. Right. But it does create a different ambience in the neighborhood to have this much uh, traffic and, 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 and lack of people who don't really feel a reason to stay there. Right. They're a transient population to a degree. But what about alternatives such as, and, and I don't know if this has any role for you or not, but what about the idea of uh, these little mini houses that you see? The LA Times has done stories about people who build these uh, small four foot wide, six to eight foot long semi vehicles and reel them around city streets, people live in them. Uh, is that a kind of housing that we should encourage in, a, in a, any society? Yeah, it's, that's, a, that's a good question. I mean, I've, Oregon and Portland has a couple yeah, of them. That. Um, I, I don't think it's gonna be easy to accomplish because uh, Santa Barbara is very proud of its zoning ordinances and its design standards. Right. And it's also a building code issue as to whether those units would meet a building code. And are, are they a mobile home park? Or are they a, a stick built kind of construction? They, they're, there's no place to put them in the building code or the zoning ordinance. Right. And I think a lot of neighbors would have a real problem with a park of many homes being built in their neighborhood. I agree, I agree with that, but one of the things that I've always been bothered by in, in, in the work I did with the homeless and 
my particular concern about RVs and, and people living on the streets. Uh, the, Santa, the city of Santa Barbara has this airport area. Mm -hmm. it, it's, I know it's not your bailiwick, <laughs> but out there there's a lot of empty lots, a lot of large spaces, warehousing and other things. It would seem to me that that's a suitable area for this type of temporary transient housing uh, that could be allowed, uh, which is what the city of Portland has done, by the way. Right. Uh, and and they, they have real rules and regulations, but people can come and go. That absorbs a considerable amount of, uh, of the very poor, uh, uh, poorest people in terms of housing. Uh, is there any idea that the city of Santa Barbara would ever uh, contemplate using its own lands, like the airport lands, for this purpose? It's been discussed. Uh, it hasn't been, uh, nobody's done a deep dive into it, but it is of concern because the airport has to generate revenue, I'm told, for airport related purposes for, uh, under the rules under which they got the land. Mm -hmm. um, they are also concerned about their relationship with the city of Goleta. Mm -hmm. I think the city of Goleta said, well, great, uh, you're solving uh, your problem but you're doing it in our town, basically, because the airport is surrounded pretty much by the city of Goleta. Well, I don't want to get started on that because <laughs> the city of Goleta has done nothing, in my opinion, to help alleviate the, the, the housing problems of the middle class or the poor. Uh, in, I don't know, out of they, they have, have the they, they, The county housing authority uh, they has new leadership, uh, and my counterpart is very active in um, getting new units in the ground in the Goleta area, and there are Be some activities going on. Before the, before Goleta was incorporated, and it's a little bit out of our <laughs> subject here, but before the, there was a few across from San Marcos High School. Right. There's a couple uh, units there. I think that might still be up. No, that's in the city of Goleta, I think. Yeah. The Stork Homes that went up on uh, near Hollister and uh, it's the Stork Road is... Um, they include some units that people self-help has built, apartments. Right. Uh, the housing authority of the county has units out at uh, Elwood Beach. Um, they have some units but that's now. That's not in, the city of Goleta. No, but uh, okay, and then this, okay, that's right, true, but it's in the area. Isla Vista, they built Pescadero Lofts for the homeless. Again, the city of Goleta has yeah. skated. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I just don't see what the city of Goleta has done, it, just like the city of Carpentria, but let's not get there. We'll go back okay. to our subject. We're running not short on time. Um, and as long as we're here, let, let's mention this, because I, I, I asked you about this when I asked you to come on the show. Along the uh, 101 freeway there between Montecito and the city of Santa Barbara, there on that mobile home park, right, right against the wall of the freeway, somebody is placing a bunch of little silly, well, I think they look sort of <laughs> cute, but, but, but little houses right. peeking over that barrier. Is this, has the housing authority anything to do with that? No, I get that call all the time. What happened there, in fact, the property was offered to us, but I thought it was too close to the freeway. It was approved as a mobile home park, and that's what used to be there. Right. And the private developer has been brought in these uh, houses uh, on the premise that they are mobile homes. Uh, I understand that's being questioned right now because they're on a fixed foundation. Um, but the city had very little role in approving them because mobile home parks are governed at the state level. So that will be... A the development is intended for affordable housing. No, it is not. Okay. They are market rate rentals, and I understand they're about 500 square feet, and the owner ex expects to get a minimum of $1,500 a month. 500 square feet. And at $1,500 a month. So, so equivalent to a one-bedroom price these days, and that's about what the market will provide. Um, but the proximity to the freeway, they will be new product. They are narrow, but... Well, wow. I haven't oh, been inside them because I, I also wondered about the uh, the exhaust and the pollution that they, they must be subjected to. There, we would have trouble building stick-built housing today next to the freeway that closely. Right. But because again, mobile homes are uh, controlled at the state level, the city had very little input on on these. Well, that's an interesting experience. I did not know that. Thank you for sharing that with the group. And I, but I, I offered it to you because I wanted you to... To defend ourselves? <laughs> yeah. We wouldn't, we wouldn't build you, anything. I help you get off the like hook that. there. Yeah, if, thank if, you. Uh, if that, because I think there is a lot of belief that, that, has it, that those things are being built by the city and uh, the city doesn't care about the impact and the aesthetics of the neighbors or anything else. And yet, as you point out, the that's, stuff that the city has built has been uh, well-maintained and, and pretty pretty nicely uh, fit into the neighborhoods. Yes. So what else can we, uh, do, should the public know about, uh, you know, this idea? Is, is, is Santa Barbara destined eternally to be for the 
the newly married and nearly buried, or uh, <laughs> this, this, this heavy load of the young and the old, yeah. students or, or wealthy uh, retirees? The dialogue's improving. Uh, May 13th, there is a, a community-wide conference that people are welcome to attend. I think it's $95. It's being put on by the Coastal Housing Coalition, largely employer-based. Employers are very concerned about the ability to draw new employees to bolster their operation. We've seen a response from employers like Cottage. I call them the institutions that can't pick up and move. UCSB, Cottage, Westmont, they have built either faculty housing or nursing, housing for nurses. Uh, Cottage's example on the Riviera, where the St. Francis Hospital used to be, is a good example, but it, it's limited. How much can they afford to do? They built 113 units there. Um, the bulk of them, 80%, go to healthcare workers. They're resale price controlled, so when the healthcare worker leaves, they get sold back to Cottage. They then resell it to someone else. They get a little increase in the, in the price and make a little bit of money, but it's not market rate driven, it's employer controlled. So the one response is those institutions that need to stay may have to get more into employer built housing, but what about the other private firms that don't have the capacity that want to stay in Santa Barbara, but they can't afford to build housing for their employees. Mm -hmm. I don't have an answer for that. Okay. I was trying. I was going to get to this question also of, uh, of this intense, uh, this idea that we're going to have an urban core, and housing is going to be smaller, and we don't have, we don't need garages mm -hmm. and all those other arguments. Uh, but I'm not sure we have time for that today. Uh, I do think that it's important, though, that the public understand that there are limited resources, n not just water and not just space, but transportation. I mean, we're, we're in a coastal uh, plain here where the tr people have to go north or south to get in and out. Uh, there, are, there, are there are physical restrictions about this, this little part of the world uh, that might not mean it's suitable for 500,000 yeah, people. But if we don't try to build the housing for the workforce to live here, we are going to continue to add commuters to US right. 101 and 154 because we have 30,000 people commuting into town every day right now. And we're either going to solve it here locally, and I would like our workforce to be able to try to live here. I well, the, 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 the best solution we, we can imagine is that have, we have an equal distribution uh, of jobs and, and housing for the people who need that. Right. But the way it comes down to is when many people want to live here, they're paying right. extraordinary rates to get the, well, the space that's here. It's always been the city's goal to have a jobs housing balance, and some of these other effects, such as the foreign language schools and city college, I think we need to have a community discussion. Either they're gonna provide the housing uh, through performance-based zoning, rather than just opening up in an office building. Okay, we're gonna get off the air now. Uh, is there any last thing you might wanna to offer to ask the people or let the people know about your work? Well, I think the stories of people struggling on housing need to be told and they need to contact their elected officials if they're struggling for housing. And we need to make a, uh, a, do a better job of making sure we preserve this community that when I moved here 40 years ago, I could afford to make the step into home ownership. Uh, I'm not sure a lot of middle class people can do that today. Thank you. Uh, Ali, Juanita, thank you in the back. Thanks to TV Santa Barbara, and you can watch the show later on TV 17.